Chapter 9. Routing The process of which routes individual travelers use, and how many use each route, affects the travel time between location and thus the accessibility. We started with the principle of least effort, wherein individual travelers seek the easiest route. This is not quite the shortest travel time path, and is far from perfect, but describes a general tendency. A minority of travelers actually minimize their travel times. Given travelers are traveling, a very important point is the inherent accounting identity of what goes in must come out, or conservation of flow. With the principle of least effort and conservation of flow, we find that traffic approaches what might be considered a user equilibrium. No traveler can do significantly better given other travelers are also trying to do their best. These processes tend to be solved for average days, but most days are not average days. There is a high degree of variability from minute to minute and day to day because the network lacks reliability. For many years, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, figure 9.1, carried all of the automobile and train traffic from the north in the Sydney CBD. From 1992, the Sydney Harbour Tunnel just west of the Opera House provided an additional route, increasing capacity and reliability of the system. We further note that individuals doing what is best for them is not inherently best for society as a whole, so we can measure a price of anarchy as the ratio of the user equilibrium and system optimal travel times. This indicates the inefficiency of the system by letting travelers choose their own routes. The access to the Sydney Harbour Bridge includes an elevated highway in front of Circular Quay, so at least some travelers can switch between the tunnel and bridge. While this adds reliability if one of them sees a capacity reduction, it also may add to inefficiency. It is not clear that this is actually a Bryce paradox when travel times actually increase with the presence of an additional link, the Cahill Expressway link in this case. While this paradox is unusual, it is also intriguing and sheds light on the complexity of networks. Managing traffic on networks can be done in many ways. Traditionally, traffic is allowed to use roads on a first-come, first-served basis, but it could be rationed so that the right to travel by car on roads is restricted by some other mechanism. The most efficient way to allocate scarce road space involves road pricing, but this has been politically difficult to achieve. 9.1 Conservation Over a period of time, the number of cars entering an intersection must be the same as the number exiting it, plus the number remaining in the intersection. The number of pedestrians entering a link must be the same as the number exiting it, excluding those with a destination on that link. In many obvious ways, there are conservation laws necessary for the short-term analysis of traffic. This accounting identity for flow is critical for understanding the amount of delay that results from traffic, with notable unusual exceptions like in figure 9.2, where an abandoned and possibly stolen Porsche in London was lifted onto a tow truck, combining two vehicles into one. There are perhaps other conservation principles. The travel time budget posits that people are, on average, conserving travel time. If one trip gets too long, other trips get cut or people adapt to keep travel times within bounds. But this is not a strict accounting identity, unlike the hours in a day. It is more of a tendency or preference. What becomes dangerous is the misapplication of the principle of conservation of flow. Imagine there are two bridges, Bridge 1 and Bridge 2, across a river, both on the cusp of congestion. Bridge 1 is closed for construction. Bridge 2 sees an increase in traffic, but not all of the traffic from Bridge 1 now crosses Bridge 2. The traffic was not conserved. Certainly some make the same trip at the same time, others make the same trip at different times, some switched modes, some of those travelers chose different destinations, others forewent that trip altogether. Just as the notion of induced demand says that when road networks are expanded with new or wider links, they see more traffic, when they are contracted they see reduced demand, there is a lot of evidence at this point. Studies of the collapse of the I-35W Mississippi River Bridge in 2007 in Minneapolis showed that about one-third of traffic simply disappeared after the collapse and no longer crossed the river daily. The remaining two-thirds used different bridges. San Francisco found similar results with the Embarcadero Freeway after the 1989 earthquake, which gave them the wherewithal to eventually remove the freeway. Trip generation is another area where conservation principles are misapplied. Traffic engineers regularly estimate the number of trips entering and exiting various types of land uses. For instance, the number of vehicles coming out of a cemetery assumed that is proportional to the size of the cemetery in acres, generating a rate like five trips per acre per day. Yet logic suggests that building a new cemetery does not increase the number of people who will die. Instead, a new cemetery will attract more of what is a fixed amount of business, and existing cemeteries less. There is, for practical purposes, a conservation of deceased people, which limits the number of trips to visit deceased people, which suggests that trips are not, strictly speaking, solely a function of the size of the cemetery. Still, these rates are built into legal code. 
Creating a facility does not automatically create demand for the facility depending on facility size. Sure, some types of activities may induce overall demand. A library may increase travel to borrow books, but others will not. After construction, a new office building does not generally increase the number of employed, it just moves them around and thus may increase employment locally. 9.2 Equilibrium User Equilibrium The journey times in all routes actually used are equal and less than those which would be experienced by a single vehicle on any unused route. System Optimality At Equilibrium, the average journey time is a minimum. John Glenn Wardrop There are several types of network equilibrium. In the classic economic sense, equilibrium occurs when supply equals demand. This implies a transport network that just serves the transport demand placed on it at the prevailing cost and where the cost of expanding the network by some amount just exceeds the economic value the network owner could obtain from that expansion. There is also an equilibrium given the existence of the network such that the travel time assumed by travelers when making trips and used in choosing the number of trips to make, when to make them, where to go, and what mode to use, equals the travel time resulting from the route choice of that demand pattern. Finally, there is the user equilibrium. Given a demand pattern, rational road users behave such that their travel costs are minimized. Provided that trip makers are omniscient in perceiving the travel costs on all routes and are able and willing to select the path with the least cost, a deterministic user equilibrium will be achieved when all used paths are least cost paths and all unused paths have cost greater or equal to the used ones. In this situation, no road user can make his travel cost less by unilaterally changing routes, subject to others doing likewise. This is illustrated in Figure 9.3. For two routes, the times on the routes are equalized at around 60 units of time, where approximately 2,000 travelers take route A and the remainder choose route B. If the way road users perceive travel cost is not identical, as in a deterministic user equilibrium, but rather accommodates uncertainty, a more general view of equilibrium, that is, stochastic user equilibrium, SUE, can be achieved. In a stochastic user equilibrium, a road user might select routes probabilistically, accounting for the actual travel time of that route and an uncertainty term describing random perception errors. In reality, such time perceptions are not simply random but depend on travel conditions and are likely to be biased. Implicit above is the notion that drivers act on the information immediately. In other words, they start the trip or switch routes at the same time they receive the information. Unfortunately, this assumption is an unrealistic description of observed reality, where there is usually a time lag between the time the information is collected and the point the driver starts the trip or switches routes. There is also the assumption that the travel time is fixed for the duration of the trip, when in fact travel time on links varies over time. Methods like Dynamic Traffic Assignment, DTA, help address these issues. 9.3 Reliability The time it takes to travel a particular route may be less important than how reliably the driver can predict the duration of the commute. If drivers can ensure reaching their destinations in a time-certain manner, they may be willing to drive on routes that take somewhat longer rather than risking the use of routes that can be traveled at faster speed on average, but that entail greater risks of arriving late. This is not a mere theoretical issue, as that situation reasonably describes the differences between signalized arterials on a grid street network, on which travel is slow but reliable, and a freeway, on which travel is fast but subject to catastrophic failures that may cause all traffic to come to a halt and provide no opportunities for the driver to exit the roadway. Travel time reliability can be measured in many different ways. One common way is to look at the standard deviation of travel time. Another compares the 95th and 50th percentile travel times. Rather than considering the value of travel time reliability, conventional planning models assume that drivers select the shortest travel time path. With GPS data about people's actual routes and the actual travel times on networks, we now have a lot of evidence that people don't actually use the shortest path. It turns out that the reliability ratio, the ratio of the value of reliability to the value of travel time, is on the order of 1. One minute of standard deviation is about as costly as one minute of travel time. People see real value to improving travel time reliability. Reliability is but one of many factors people consider when choosing routes. In addition to perceived travel time and reliability, we might add tolls, aesthetics, number of stops, familiarity, the availability of services, gas stations, coffee, McMuffins, type of road, some people hate freeways, others hate traffic lights, circuity, and perceived safety, among many others. Trying to improve reliability is one of the main justifications for any number of traffic management programs, including ramp metering, highway helpers, and high-occupancy toll lanes. 9.4 Profit 
Price of Anarchy How inefficient is it to let everyone decide their own routes? The ratio of the travel time that results from each user trying to minimize their own time, subject to everyone else doing the same, the user equilibrium travel time, and the travel time that results from systematically allocating routes to drivers to minimize the total travel time on the network, the system optimal travel time, is the price of anarchy. This is a measure of how much inefficiency results from individuals choosing their own routes. One could imagine softly encouraging travelers to take routes for the benefit of others through, for instance, exhortation or travel or information. One can imagine doing so more rigorously through congestion prices that were set at a level to ensure that the two travel costs, time plus money, were equivalent in the user equilibrium and system optimal frameworks. However, it turns out that the price of anarchy is relatively small on real networks. When there is no congestion, the price of anarchy is 1. When the network is supersaturated, the price of anarchy also approaches 1. When traffic is congested, some travelers, we might call them traffic entrepreneurs, seek alternative routes. This tends to help the network reach equilibrium. The price of anarchy is somewhat higher in practice during moderate congestion. While the price of anarchy is small, the flow differences are more significant. As shown in Figure 9.5, in the Twin Cities, application of a travel demand model suggests there is more traffic on freeways in a user equilibrium routing and less on arterials than is the case of a system optimal routing. We can attribute this to various factors, among them most people don't know alternative routes very well, as well as habit. 9.5 The Bryce Paradox Adding capacity can sometimes increase travel time. Elsewhere, we identified induced demand, which suggests that adding capacity might not reduce congestion because new travelers are attracted to the route. Even if there were no more travelers, adding capacity to a transport network does not guarantee that individual travelers will enjoy shorter travel times. In some cases, the counterintuitive, paradoxical result that adding capacity leads to an average rise of travel times arises. The paradox was introduced by Dietrich Bryce in 1968. It shows that adding one link to a simple four-link network may cause longer travel times for every traveler if all travelers choose to minimize their own travel times. In this case, each traveler's decision to act selfishly may achieve a user equilibrium that makes everyone worse off and thus increase total travel cost. Results from two widely cited cases present counterintuitive consequences of either expanding the network, Stuttgart, or removing links from the network, New York City. In both instances, the Bryce Paradox has been argued to explain the unexpected results. Still, research in this field is largely conceptual and usually based on small networks with simplified link performance functions. Ever since this phenomenon was first described in the literature, it has been widely studied due to its significance for network design. On a more general network, Steinberg and Zwangli conclude that the Bryce Paradox is about as likely to occur as not occur, with random rather than planned additions. Clearly, the occurrence of the Bryce Paradox depends on link congestion function parameters and the demand for travel. A 2008 study further explored this concept and identified links that might trigger the Bryce Paradox on sketch networks of Boston, New York, and London. Although this research was based on maps of real networks, it still assumed aggregate link performance functions, which map traffic flow onto travel time, and unique origin-destination pairs. A series of independent and repeated route choice experiments of participants when facing a Bryce Paradox type network in two laboratory experiments concluded that the paradox was likely. Our own classroom experience suggests that engineering students who are exposed to the concept of the Bryce Paradox are much more amenable to the idea that adding capacity does not necessarily reduce travel times. The relative lack of field evidence suggests that the Bryce Paradox is primarily a theoretical curiosity and is too extreme to be a widespread real world phenomenon due to complexity in travel behavior and network conditions. To date, we have found no convincing studies that empirically demonstrate the Bryce Paradox on real, large-scale networks. This may be due to, first, the difficulties in accurately measuring network flow and travel time, second, individual valuations on the costs of travel used in selecting routes, third, confounding factors contributing to long-term changes in travel demand and pattern, fourth, the lack of clearly defined impact zone isolated from the rest of the network, fifth, the relative rarity of such paradoxes, and six, the political difficulty of an empirical large-scale real-world trial. However, while absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, it is suggestive. After searching for Bigfoot for decades in a world where everyone has a camera in their pocket, surely the expectation of finding Bigfoot decreases. Still, the conversion of Broadway and Manhattan, one section of which is shown in figure 9.6, from a through route is a good candidate for the general proposition that removing a link can increase speeds and the efficiency of the network in addition to creating great pedestrian spaces. But whether this case is, strictly speaking, a Bryce paradox as opposed to some other paradox, 
perhaps in this case related to the complexity of traffic signal coordination, when the grid is interrupted by a diagonal route or even reduced demand, is unclear. Researchers have also captured new paradoxes under different network conditions. 9.6 Rationing Scarce resources are rationed for safety, efficiency, and equity. In many cases, travelers or vehicles are controlled by external devices for safety or equity reasons. Air traffic control allocates takeoff and landing slots at airports. Traffic signals allocate the space at intersections to different traffic streams in turn. Ramp meters limit traffic from entering freeways. Parking meters ration the use of scarce curbside road space. In each case, the travelers will have to wait for their turn, but because they arrive at their convenience, randomly from the point of view of the control system, they may experience more waiting time than strictly necessary. Intelligent Transportation Systems, or ITS, are about introducing information technologies into surface transport. The most important information technology is price. Price is not itself a good, but rather a mechanism that provides information about the value at which people will exchange one good or service for another. The price tells you that you will have to give up so many dollars in exchange for a widget, the right to ride the bus, or to travel across the bridge. The first problem in surface transport in advanced economies, where the networks and vehicles exist and are widespread, is who gets to use which piece of infrastructure at what time. The problem of allocation. The second is the problem of paying for the maintenance of existing facilities. The problem of funding. The structural feature at the core of these problems is the lack of an apparent price that is sensitive to time of day, location, and costs. When travelers drive an untold road in the United States, they still have a relatively small personal cost. Their time and monetary costs have operated in an automobile, including gas taxes. But those prices contain very little information and do not represent actual costs they impose on the system. That is, the marginal cost of one additional car trip. The cost of fuel does not reflect the cost of traveling during the peak, except to the extent that fuel consumption is higher in stop-and-go traffic, or the cost of traveling on costly or critical facilities. The price travelers face is not real-time or real space, but rather an abstracted expectation of average costs, assuming drivers pay their full costs, which they don't, especially off the freeway or even on the freeway when you count for externalities. Often, the most efficient way of rationing a scarce resource is charging for it. This typically reduces demand compared with no price and, if set appropriately, can help ensure supply matches demand. Early tolls require travelers to stop, as illustrated in Figure 9.8. With modern technology, prices are collected while vehicles are in motion and can vary in time and place to reflect the real costs of travel, just as other goods have prices that vary with demand. When demand is up for gasoline or houses, the prices rise. When supplies rise, prices fall. When demand falls or supply rises, the price falls with it. The price represents the matching of consumers' willingness to pay, to the extent the supplier has monopoly powers, with suppliers' willingness to accept, assuming competition in the marketplace. This can simultaneously solve both the problem of allocation and reduce, if not eliminate, congestion in the problem of funding. Thus, the problem is less about our technical ability to reduce congestion and more about our lack of political will. 9.7. Pricing Pricing both raises revenue and allocates demand. Prices can vary spatially. Some routes are more expensive than others, or temporally, some times are more expensive than others. It turns out that temporal differences in prices are far more important because the price of anarchy is so low. The right price from a theoretical economic perspective is the marginal cost of travel, or the difference between the external cost, the cost imposed on everyone else, and the private or internal cost, the cost travelers bear themselves. This is defined as the change in total cost with respect to the change in flow. This assumes a more macroscopic perspective than queuing analysis, and requires understanding the static relationship between aggregate flow and average travel time, a link performance function, as shown in the light-shaded area in figure 9.9. Using more dynamic deterministic queuing ideas, we can see the exact costs one additional traveler imposes costs on everyone else. Imagine a bottleneck that serves one car every two seconds, but demand is one car every second, for one minute. And then cars stop arriving. After two seconds, two cars arrive and one car has been served. After 60 seconds, 60 cars have arrived and 30 cars have been served. After two minutes, 60 cars have arrived and 60 have been served. Wouldn't it be better if cars arrived right when they could be served, rather than queuing needlessly? Prices can incentivize travelers to do that. 
The marginal or incremental cost of each car depends on which position the car arrived in. The first car in the queue delays all the following cars. The last car in the queue delays no one. Since there are 60 cars in our example and each is delayed 2 seconds by the presence of a car ahead of it, the first car imposes a total of 120 seconds of delay in external costs. The second car imposes 118 seconds of delay on the following vehicles, and so on, until the next to last car imposes 2 seconds of delay upon the last car. Imagine a value of travel time savings of 25 cents a minute, or $15 an hour. This doesn't necessarily mean the toll for the first car is 2 minutes, times 25 cents a minute equals 50 cents. We also need to consider schedule delay, that is, early and late penalties. If everyone wants to arrive at the end of minute 1, but not everyone can, they have already spread themselves out some. Prices just do that a bit more. Thus, the highest toll might be at second 58, or second 60, which would guarantee arrival at minute 1, and it would be lower as we get farther from that time till it gets to zero, or a baseline flat toll, at second zero or second 120, where people are maximally early or maximally late. The shape of this tolling triangle depends on preferences for early and late arrival. Usually, each additional minute of late arrival at work is considered more costly than being a minute early or spending a minute en route. Coordinating to the level of the exact second may be challenging, but imagine each second is a minute and each car is 60 cars and this occurs over a two-hour rush hour period instead of two minutes. Spreading the traffic out over time can eliminate all delay and make society as a whole better off. It has the potential to make no one individual worse off, but this depends on the value of time of different travelers, desired arrival times, and their demand patterns, and what is done with the revenue. With the right prices and the right information, everyone arrives on time without delay.